uh, we are going through the book of Acts because we are a church that believes in being rooted in the word and empowered by the spirit. Right? We, we believe that the Bible is God's inerrant word spoken to believers. It's the final matter for all issues of life, doctrine, and practice. We want to be people of the book. Okay? We believe this is the expectation that Jesus created for believers. And we also believe that a faithful reading of Scripture will, will teach us that we should expect to encounter the God that we read about in the pages. That the Bible doesn't say, listen, okay, like God did all this neat stuff and then he left. Instead, it says, well, listen, he's real. He's here right now. God, the Holy Spirit is on the earth. You can walk with him in power, and that should be your expectation. But we also recognize that, okay, like there have been people who, who have had this viewpoint before. Maybe they, they've practiced and done things in a way that made us a little bit kind of skeeved out or like, I don't see that in the Bible. And we don't want to do that. We don't want to give way to uh, tradition and superstition in our, in our pursuit of the, the power and gifts of the Spirit. Like we want to do this in a way that the Scripture teaches. And we thought, man, one of the best ways to do this is to just go through uh, a great story of the church being empowered by the Spirit, the book of Acts, which is the story of the birth of Christianity. So we've been going through it. And uh, I want to just let you know up front today, that, uh, here's the kind of talk that we're going to do, okay? Because this is like, it's forming us. Sometimes like, you know, we all, we, we all want different things out of a sermon. Like maybe say you came in and man, you're just downtrodden and you're just hoping for a word from God that's going to speak exactly to your situation. Man, okay, I want, I, I, like, my, my boss at work was terrible to me this week and I'm not even sure I'm going to have a job next week and I'm exhausted and I don't know what to do. Does God even care? And I would tell you, praise God for you. Hold on. My hope is that the Holy Spirit just washes over you in this place and you meet with him in a way that refreshes your heart. Maybe you're like, you're struggling in your marriage. Maybe you're struggling uh, with, with your kids or a family member and you're just like, like, God, where are you? What do I do? Hold on because I believe the Lord is here. But this ain't that kind of sermon. Okay. One of the funny things with my job is uh, sometimes what we do is we direct the church as a whole. Um, and as we're going through Acts, one of the things that we want to do is create a healthy culture. And a culture is not a one-talk thing. And so what we're going to read about today is largely some church logistics. And it would be easy to be like, what does this mean for me? Well, are you part of the church? Here, here's the deal. I, I don't expect you to remember anything that I'm going to say today. I don't expect anybody like, to walk away with like, I'm going to tweet that. That's amazing. <laughs> Probably not. But I do think, my, my hope would be as we look at what the book says, that the Lord will begin to sort of form your, your worldview and your church worldview in a way that it sticks with you even when you don't remember where you got it from. And so that as we, as we go into the word about, hey, this is, this is some things to realize with being part of a church and what a church is, that, that we would go, okay, okay, yeah, you know what? I see it. Um, so this is, this, is a, this is a talk for our church as a whole, not necessarily an individual, although maybe it'll speak to you uh, with where you've been. Could be, could be. I, I just, I don't know. So here's, a, here's the background of the passage we're about to read. Last week, we talked about the first Gentile Christians, okay? So you got this moment where Christianity, it begins with uh, just Jewish people, and then it turns out like God wants to reach the world through the gospel. And so uh, what happens is that, is that uh, Peter, he's, he's sort of unexpectedly called to this Roman centurion's house, a guy named Cornelius, like, like an angel shows up to Cornelius and tells him, hey, call for a guy named Peter. Peter's off somewhere else. He has a vision, and basically he's told, listen, go with these guys. And so he goes, and he tells them the gospel, okay, that Jesus has died for their sin. He's risen from the dead. You can be made right with God through what Jesus has done for you. It's not about how good of a person you are. It's about how good of a person Jesus is. And he has died to save you, right? So like while Peter's telling them the gospel, the Holy Spirit falls and these people become Christians. Like they start, they, they start being empowered in the same way that the Jewish believers were back in Acts 2. And Peter's like, well, listen, we need to just go ahead and baptize them. Then clearly like God is not showing a distinction. Let's bring them into the family. Now, that's awesome if you're a Gentile. And it's really offensive if you're a Jew. And the reason it's offensive is Jesus is supposed to be the fulfillment of messianic prophecies for the people of Israel. And suddenly these unclean Gentiles who have not kept the law, who are not, to anyone's stretch of the imagination, part of God's promise are being grafted in. And so Peter goes home after this really, really cool moment. But now what's going to happen is he's going to meet with his brothers and sisters in the church. And they're going to have some things to say about it. 
Because they don't know. They didn't have the vision. Like, like they didn't see the angel that Cornelius saw. They didn't have the vision of the sheet coming down that, that Peter saw. Like, they had none of that. They're going based on what they've known up until this moment. And so in Acts 11, starting in verse 1, we're going to read just verses 1 through 3. We'll pause, we'll read them again, and then we'll finish the story. So Acts 11, 1 through 3 says this. The apostles and believers throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles had also, or had also had received the word of God. So when Peter went out to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers criticized him and said, he went into the house of uncircumcised men and ate with them. In other words, Peter, what are you doing? These guys, they're like, first of all, they're, they're uncircumcised. I mean, like, they are, like, like, they're not part of what God is doing. They're not part of the covenant. They're not part of the promise. In fact, you went into their house, which you're not supposed to do, and you were eating with them, and you're showing fellowship, you're showing approval. You're, like, you're, you're basically saying, hey, like, we, we are together. Like, do you understand what you've just done? Now, here's the neat part with these three verses. The neat part is this, okay, that these three verses represent a really, really good pendulum for what we need to know as a church, Okay. And so I'm going to show you like one side, the other, I'm not a pendulum, a balance, okay? Like, he's like one side really good to realize, other side really good to realize. And I think if we see what's right here, we're going to see some really good stuff for us. So here's the first thing to realize, okay? When they go to, or when they go to Peter and they're like, man, what are you doing? They've got a point. And the reason they have a point is this, okay? Because number one, all right, their entire scope of God has been Old Testament law, which is now becoming uh, changed in terms of how we interact with that in, in Christ now. And so they, they have no framework for how can a person even walk with God and not be keeping the law? They've never had to ask that question, okay? But then on top of that, listen, they are a church that's just come out of an immense persecution, all right, so remember, there's this whole thing with this guy named Saul who becomes Paul where he was breathing out threats against the Christians. He's doing everything that he can to destroy the church. And then God goes actually about that and converts him, right? Like, like the Lord shows up, turns him into Paul, makes him a chief of believers, like a guy who's gonna be like an advocate for the faith. And so at the end of that story, remember, like, it's just like the persecution's like cooled down and, and now they're enjoying a time of peace. So here's why I'm bringing this up. Because, okay, that's just happened. And now here's Peter and he's going to Gentiles, which means, listen, like Peter, you're making it really bad for us with, with our Jewish brothers and sisters around us. Like we're just now getting peace from them where they're not trying to kill us. And suddenly what you're saying is, listen, let's go ahead and meet with people who aren't Jewish. Let's go ahead and let it, it's not about the law. Let's go ahead and let's meet with people who aren't keeping the law. Do you understand how bad PR that is for us? And they've got a point. Because it's not just about marketing. It could cost people their lives. What we have to do is come to this place of going, listen, it's not about what's best for me. It's not about my own personal level of comfort. It's not about, let me say it like this, it's not about what gives the church the best PR. Because there are going to be times where we take stands for things and the only thing that can happen is offense in the eyes of the world. It's inevitable. There are people who are around who will never be happy as long as you stand for anything. There are people, let me say it like this, there are people who have inherently an unbiblical worldview and they're fine with it. Like, oh, you, you believe whatever you want until what you believe contradicts what they think you should do. And then suddenly the offensive meter goes through the roof, doesn't it? Because as much as we, I'll just say, as much as we claim as Americans we are tolerant, what we're actually tolerant of is the things that, that just go and ebb and flow with culture. And we can't go that route. So the question is not what gives the church the best PR. Or PR. Here's the question, and this, and this is why Peter got to where he was. The question is, where is the Lord going? That's the question. Dang, kick's got some pipes. <laughs> All right. Now, here's, here's what that also means, okay? Here's what that also means. That also means that when it comes down to church and life within the church, okay, one of the worst things that we can do is gauge what is right and good by our own preferences. Here they are, and, and their entire lives, what they've known has been a very specific form of spirituality. 
So what they do is they go, like to walk with God means that you keep the law. And so worship is going to look a certain way. Life is going to look a certain way. And now the Lord shows up and he goes, actually, I'm going to shake up the entire way that you do things. Here's why this is important, okay? Because we do this all the time. All of us, like if you're in Christianity whatsoever, like we'll go lifelong convert, we'll go new convert. Here's what this looks like, okay? All of us, like we grow up in church and we either try to go back to what we grew up in or we try to get away from it, uh, get away from it if it makes us uncomfortable. So what we do is we go, oh, listen, like, you know, I experienced God in this place. And so this is the kind of place where God is, right? And same way, okay, like if you're new at this, maybe like you had a place where like the Lord showed up, he converted you, and now you assume, okay, like that kind of environment for church is where the Lord is. And the mistake that you're making is you're confusing the thing that God used with God himself. Okay. And so, and so what happens? Okay. Like, so we'll, 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 let's just go through in our lifetime. It would go something like this. All right. Let's talk about the worship wars. Some of you might be too, too young to remember this, but this was a thing. Remember the worship wars? The worship wars was, okay, listen, all right, like we've grown up in, in church and, and there were, and, and what is godly worship? Well, it's hymns, okay? Like if it's, if it's less than 100 years old, it's probably not spiritual, right? Like uh, I'm being simplistic, okay? Like we just sang a hymn this morning. I'm not against hymns. Okay, but the thought was, okay, listen, like these, this newfangled hippie music with the, the guitars and the drums, like that's, that's, that's not, like God couldn't possibly be in that. That's, that's too secular, right? And then we all kind of just like realize like, oh, actually it can be both, right? But this was the thought, okay? I grew up in this. This is my worship preference. This this is how God speaks to me. Therefore, this must be the way that God does it. And it was wrong. Yeah, he speaks to you. Yeah, he uses it, but don't think that he can't use the other thing. In the same way, let me say it like this. Um, here's the space where, like, as, you know, as we're going towards the charismatic, as we're going towards the gifts of the Spirit, here's where charismatic get tripped up, just so that you know. They confuse length of service and emotion with activity of the Holy Spirit. And so it goes like this. It goes, all right, listen, okay, man, that song wasn't drawn out for 15 choruses. <laughs> Holy Spirit must not be in it. I'm, that sounds ridiculous. I'm not gonna ask you if you thought it, but how many of you heard it? Oh, yeah. Hey, like, you know, it's, it's just too dry. It's just, it's just too dry, man. You know what? Like, okay, like th there wasn't enough. Okay, right, these, the, like, this is the verbs that we use, man. Like, you know, I had a, I had a buddy who was a pastor one time. I mean, and, and this lady in the church came up to him and she said, hey, I just want you to know that I'm, I'm leaving the church. And he said, well, why? And she goes, well, I just, I just don't sense the Lord here anymore. And he went, really? And she goes, yeah. And he goes, okay, I want you to really think about what you're saying. Are you saying that we as a church have sinned in such a way as to cause the Holy Spirit to depart from us? She went, no, I'm not saying that. And he goes, okay, so let's just, let's just figure out like what's going on here. You know what it came down to? Song choice preference. The, the songs that they were picking and the way they were singing them, she didn't like. But what happened, now, now we're giggling, but here's what happens. We have these moments where the Lord shows up, he ministers to our hearts in powerful ways. I love worship and I love church, okay? And we think, that, okay, this is how you cultivate an atmosphere for the Holy Spirit to show up. Let me just remind you that here in Acts 10, when Peter is preaching the gospel, he's not even expecting the Holy Spirit to show up and he falls. Which should tell you this has nothing to do with the way that we just sort of get the lights right and the air conditioning set to the perfect temperature and get the song at the perfect length. No, no, it's when the Lord chooses to move. And so the question that we want to ask is, where is the Lord going? The other thing to realize, and if you're taking notes, write this down, is just to understand that, listen, just because it's my preference doesn't mean that it's God's will. Okay? It doesn't. There are going to be times where, hey, this doesn't look the way that you think it should look. And that's okay. Because you know what? Look, man, there are services, I sense nothing. <laughs> and somebody comes up to me after, you don't know how I need to hear that. Praise God. <laughs> he knew. You know, don't assume that because it's not ministering to you in the way that you want that day, that it means the Lord's not part of it. Because you have no idea what the Spirit of God is up to. And let's just also acknowledge, by the way, there is no verse in the New Testament that talks about feeling the Holy Spirit. You know that, right? There's, there's nothing in the epistles, nothing in Acts. It's like, and then they got the tinglys and the Lord was there. <laughs> so perhaps the Spirit of God is much more consistent and faithful than we give him credit. Okay, so, so I told you that there's a pendulum. So the one side is, okay, let's get rid of the preference. But here's the other side of this pendulum. So reread uh, verse one again. It says, the apostles and the believers throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles 
also received the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers criticized him and said, you went into the house of uncircumcised men and ate with them. Okay, here's why I wanna just highlight that again. Because it's easy to give flag for it where these guys got it wrong. But there's a church culture here, like in, in this text, that I want you to see. You know what it is? Um, that Peter is accountable for his actions. Now, this is big, okay? Because if ever there's anybody who should be like, listen, I'm God's guy. Jesus said, I'm going to be the rock that he builds his church on. Like, I'm the man of God. I'm the man of power for the hour. Like, who are you to question me? Let's understand that's not how they looked at this. That from the jump, they went, Peter, what are you doing? Now, this is really, really important, okay? Because what we have to understand, and this is so huge, is the following. Write this down. That nobody is above accountability. Nobody. Nobody is so spiritual. Nobody hears the Lord so clearly. Nobody is such a gifted pe- preacher, a like healer, what have you. Nobody is above accountability, all right, like now here's why I'm bringing this up, okay? Because in charismatic culture, oftentimes there is a thing, it's about the man of power for the hour. And we elevate the man of God. And we go, listen, this is the man of God for the people. And so like he's hearing clearly from God for us and he's the guy and like, let's just raise him up. And the, and the, the verbiage that's thrown around right now is called honor culture. And we go, listen, like, it's about honoring our leaders. And I would say when our leaders do honorable things, we honor them. But we don't honor dishonor. We don't say, because like when somebody is behaving in a shady way, when somebody is behaving in maybe an emotionally manipulative or abusive way, if somebody is perpetually lying, if somebody is acting in a way that is not like Christ and is not in step with the Holy Spirit, we don't look at that and be like, well, that's good. And you know what? They get a pass because they're a man of God or they're a woman of God. We don't, we don't function that way. Oh, no, 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 no. Let, let's just realize something. Listen, Peter himself, again, the one that Jesus goes, I'm going to build my church on how you preach. Like, come on. Peter's not about this, okay? And so you might go, well, why, why, why is he willing to take this kind of like, like, why is he meeting with believers? He's kind of like, like okay, he has to give an account for his actions, and he will. He's gonna have to explain what he did and why, all right? Let's recognize something, though. Let's recognize, that, okay, Peter lived by something. You know what Peter lived by? He lived by the teachings of Jesus, his rabbi, his Lord. You know what Jesus said about like how we're to treat leaders and leadership? Here's what he said in Matthew 23, verses 6 through 10. Talking about the Pharisees. He goes, they love the place of honor at banquets and the most important seats in the synagogue. They love the respect. They love the reverence. They love to be greeted with respect in the marketplace and to be called a rabbi or teacher by men. So they're walking through, I've earned this, you know. And Jesus goes, let me tell you about how my people are going to do this. Verse 8. But you're not to be called rabbi. You're not to be called teacher. No, 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 no. For you have one teacher. Who? God right? And you're all brothers. Hey, it's not a tier system of there's the man of God up here and then there's believers. You're all brothers. All of you. Verse nine, and do not call anyone father. You ever heard somebody call a religious leader father? It's contradicting this. Do not call anyone on earth father. Why? For you have one father and he's in heaven. Verse 10, nor are you to be called instructors, for you have one instructor, the Messiah. Peter lived by this. Hey, I'm not elevated above everybody else or anybody else. We're all brothers here. Like, we're all one people. And yes, there's leadership, and yes, there's callings, but let's not for a second think this is a thing of, hey, there's the more spiritual person, and then there's everybody else. There's the more person who's more in tune with God, and then there's regular believers. It doesn't work that way. You know, we make the joke here all the time. There's no such thing as JV Holy Spirit. And that's true. Since you're a God who's in me, isn't you? Like, we're in this together. And we see Peter at every opportunity when he could be elevated, he actually throws it to the side. I'll give you another example. I don't know if you remember in the story of him with Cornelius that we read last week, there's this detail in chapter 10, where when Peter goes before Cornelius, because like the Lord has set up his arrival to proclaim the gospel, you remember what Cornelius does when he meets Peter? Look at this, verse 25, as, as Acts 10. As Peter entered the house, Cornelius met him and fell at his feet in reverence. And look at verse 26, here's how Peter treated this. But Peter made him get up. Stand up, he said, I'm only a man myself. 
and you go, okay, Bert, why, why are you bringing this, bringing this up? Um, most of us are not leaders. That's true. But most of us are affected by them. And to guard our hearts and guard our church, I just want to have this at our understanding. Hey, you know what? If anybody elevates themselves to a position of above as though they deserve reverence and awe because of how gifted they are or the office that they hold, they have departed from the expectation of Christ. Gifts do not mean validation of doctrines. Gifts do not mean that you get a free pass with whatever you do. And in this era where it's easy, like, well, this is my guy, this is my pastor, this is my leader, and so I'm just going to side with them, I'm going to turn a blind eye to that. People prey on this. There's a reason that narcissism can thrive in church spaces. Because we think we're being obedient to God. We think it's a thing of, okay, if I just don't listen, okay, like I'm going to let God deal with that. And what I'm telling you is no one is above accountability. And if there's ever a point of like, so like me or anybody who's out, so like, I don't have to answer for what I did. I've been here long enough. I've earned enough clout. Let me, let me explain. You know what I've earned, I think, here, having been here 14 years? I've earned maybe the benefit of the doubt that you would assume that I'm not terrible in my motives. I've never earned not being questioned. Okay? I've never, like, I've never come into a space that, you know, I've preached the Bible well enough, I've served people well enough, I've been here long enough that you don't have the right to go, man, why did he do it like that? Now, it would do me a lot of joy if you assume that I'm not out to get you, but I'd rather let my actions show that than it me demanded of you. Okay? And so, like, and again, like, we, we have this, 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 this misunderstanding when we honor our leaders, and then people they actually misquote Old Testament verses, and they'll be like, you know why? You, I mean, you think I'm crazy, but I'm telling you, it's thriving everywhere. Like, listen, like, don't criticize your leader. Why? Because of what David said, I will not touch the Lord's anointed. And let's understand there's a difference between a New Testament church leader and a murderous Old Testament king. That's what it's referencing, right? David, like, when David says, I won't touch the Lord's anointing, what he's saying is, I'm not going to murder Saul. There's a bit of a gap there. But it sounds spiritual, so we just roll with it. And what I want you to see is how it's actually done in the church that Jesus created. It isn't this thing of let's elevate this one guy and we're going to bow down before. No, they're, they're brothers, they're sisters, they're in this together. And so here's Peter. And in this instance, his actions, they are honorable. And what he does, he just plainly lays out for them exactly what he did. He doesn't spin it. There's no like fudging of the details. There's no like, let me kind of sway it in a way that makes me look the best. He just clearly, here's what I did and why. And I would say this, listen, in accountability, the truth is good enough. If you have to spin it, you're probably in the wrong. And so here's, Going forward in chapter 11. So, hey, Peter, what are you doing? And so it says this again. And here's Peter giving an account for his actions. Verse 4, starting from the beginning, Peter told them the whole story. I was in the city of Joppa praying. And in a trance, I saw a vision. I saw something like a large sheet being let down from heaven by its four corners. And it came down to where I was. I looked into it and saw four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, reptiles, and birds. Then I heard a voice telling me, get up, Peter, kill and eat. I replied, surely not, Lord. Nothing impure or unclean has ever entered my mouth. You, you notice, by the way, like Peter's transparency, he acknowledges that he didn't get it right. <laughs> Do you see that? And he's like, I didn't realize what God was doing. All right. Verse nine, the voice spoke from heaven a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times. And then it was pulled up to heaven again. Right then, three men who had been sent to me from Caesarea stopped at the house where I was staying. The Spirit told me to have no hesitation about going with them. These six brothers also went with me, and we entered the man's house. He told us how he had seen an angel appear in his house and say, Send to Joppa for Simon, who is called Peter. He will bring you a message through which you and all your household will be saved. And as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit came on them as he had come on us at the beginning. Then I remember what the Lord said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So if God gave them the same gift he gave us who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I to think I could stand in God's way? In other words, 
how could I maintain a boundary that God had so clearly ignored? And this is really great, okay? Because he's saying this, and they're going, oh, yeah, that, that actually makes sense. And, and, and he's not alone in this. So there, there are witnesses who had gone with him who had seen all of it happen. And so, again, here's what he's going by. And, and, and in our case, to get rid of our preferences, the thing that I think is good for us to ask is the question that we asked earlier. Just simply put, where is the Lord going? That's what we want to ask. Okay, not what's, what makes me most comfortable in church, like what keeps me happiest. Hey, not, not because it's the, the, the part of this, what will happen is like, because churches, as we exist together. What happens is that we, 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 we create unintentionally, and every group does this, we create an unintentional status quo where this is what it looks like, this is what I should expect. And oftentimes we do this and we retreat into our comfort spaces to the neglect of asking this question. But this question is really, really big. Where's the Lord going? Where does he want to take us as a people? What does he want to do through us? And so, I love this, verse 18. When they heard this, and I'd be translated as, as uh, they had no further objections. Literally, it's uh, they became silent. In other words, it's uh, they hear him talk and they just, maybe you have a moment like that in life where just something hits you right in the heart and you, there's nothing you can say. You're just kind of like, oh my gosh, you know? And so it says, and they became silent and praised God saying, so then, you know, okay, here's where we are. Even to the Gentiles, God has granted repentance that leads to life. So, hey, the Gentile church, like becoming part of this, it was God's idea for those walking in step with the Holy Spirit come to recognize it and they celebrate what God is doing, Right? And that last phrase, can we put it on the screen one more time? Because I just I love what they call salvation here. I just want you to see it. God has granted the repentance that leads to life. I just want to highlight that because that's not the way many of us would want to reference the gospel. What our culture wants is something like this. Our culture wants to be happy. And our culture wants a God, okay, maybe I'm, maybe I'm happy, but I could be happier. Will your God make me happier? All right. And so it goes, okay, listen, you're a good person. Like, basically, here, here's the gospel that most of us want. Hey, you know what? You're a pretty good person. But, you could, but your life could be better. Here's, try Jesus. Like a breath mint. Try Jesus. Okay. <laughs> Just so that you're a little bit fresher. Okay. And let's understand the skewed viewpoint. No, you're not good. No, you're not. Well, I feel good. Well, according to God, you're not. I, I, I'm, I'm sure you have friends that say that you are, but actually, if you were to look at the sight of a holy God, he would say you have disqualified yourself from eternity. Because the only one who can stand before God is the one without sin. And all of us have fallen short. And so... He's given Christ to make us right with him. But let's understand that sin is a big deal. Okay? So what many of us want is we want this palatable version of the gospel that only talks about God's mercy and forgiveness and never talks about his justice or wrath. Right? We don't want to talk about hell. We don't want to talk about repentance, turning from sin and turning to God. Like Because we believe we're basically good and we'll figure it out on our own. And it'd be awesome if God is championing me as I figure it out on my own. You are a reprobate sinner. Unless you repent of your sin, you will not know life. Like, unless you turn from your sin and turn to him. This is why, like Bonhoeffer talked about this idea, listen, like, he, he, called, he, called, he called it costly grace. It was the idea, or I'm sorry, cheap grace. It was the idea, listen, okay, cheap grace is basically, it's preaching grace without repentance. And yes, any and every person can be forgiven of their sin, but if you choose to rebel against the Lord, if you choose to turn away from him and persist in that, you're playing with fire. And no, I'm not saying that you get it perfect all the time. And yes, you are going to get tripped up. And yes, his grace and mercy is going to be enough for you. And he'll help you stand back to your feet when you fall down. Yes and amen for all of that, because none of us are good enough to walk in a way so much as to earn the gospel. But hear me, please hear me. That doesn't mean that you play with sin and that God's cool with it, because he's not. 
He's not. In fact, I would argue with you, if you're choosing to persist in rebellion against the Lord, it means you don't have the Holy Spirit. Like if you're like, hey, listen, I'll be forgiven. I can do whatever I want. It means you're dead in your sin and you're not convicted. And that should scare the bejesus out of you. And so here's they are, here they are. And what they call it is the repentance that leads to life. Why? Because sin kills. It does. But God is life. And as you turn from your sin and turn to him, he'll save you. This is the part why I think we get tripped up in our culture is because we think it's a thing of, let me show my goodness. Let, and, so, and so when I say turn from your sin and turn to him, nobody wants to hear that because what, what we're saying is that somebody is disqualified. And what I'm saying is everybody's disqualified. And, and, and instead what it is, is you turning to him, Lord, I am incapable of this. I need you. All right? That is not popular, but it's biblical. So on that fun upper, <laughs> let me pray for us. Okay. Lord, we're going to repent of some things together right now. Number one, Father, we repent of our religious idolatry. We repent of our preferences. We repent of telling you where you can go. Would you keep us in step with your spirit? Lord, wherever you're going is where we want to go. And we abandon saying this is how it should be. We, we don't know. Lord, we repent of our exaltation of leadership in an unhealthy way. We repent of this viewpoint of the, the prophet or the whatever. Um, we acknowledge your word and command that only you are to be elevated to the place of worship and that we are all brothers and sisters. And we thank you, Lord, that in your provision for us, you've spoken this to protect your kids. And lastly, right now, Lord, I want to ask you, um, if there's anybody sitting here today who's been complacent, who's come to accept rebellion, would you convict them in the power of the Holy Spirit right now? Bring them from death to life. Show them what you have for them. Not in a condemning way. This isn't a thing of, oh, you're the worst, therefore. Instead, you love us and want to save us from our sin. Or would you let us rest in the power of the gospel there that you bring sinners from death to life? Please save now. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.